Okay, uh, good morning, everyone. Um, thank you so much for coming to my third year talk. Uh, I am really happy to start us all off today talking about some preliminary work investigating possibilities for new representations of data analysis pipelines. Something that I spend a lot of time thinking about is how we can push the frontier in terms of what can be accomplished by visual representations of data. Of course, we know that data visualizations are great at showing us trends in the world. Recently, a colleague of mine and I were reading the results from the stage three trial of the Pfizer COVID-19 vaccine study, where we found this cumulative incidence plot. You can see that time is on the x-axis and occurrences of participants in the study being diagnosed with COVID is on the y-axis. So we can really see here that after the second dose of the vaccine is given several days after the first dose, the incidence rate completely flattens out, which of course is really exciting news for all of us. Visual representations of data aren't just limited to data visualizations though. Data tables are valuable tools for organizing data values. This table, uh, which is from the same Pfizer vaccine study, has an amusing data point in it, where 33% of participants who received the placebo reported feeling fatigued after getting just an injection of saline. I'm sure we can all relate to how they are feeling at this point in the pandemic. Data visualizations can also have some particularly surprising utility. For example, you can perform null hypothesis testing with data graphics. Here we have six maps that show how cancer deaths are distributed across Texas. Five of the graphs show randomly generated data under the null hypothesis, and one of the graphs shows the real data. Can you guess which one of the graphs shows the real data? If so, type the number corresponding to the real graph in the chat, and congratulations, you've just performed a hypothesis test. We can see in these plots uh, and tables uh, are usually the end of a long and sometimes challenging process. By the time a reader is presented with a figure, the underlying data have, all, have most likely been extensively processed, meaning that the data have been filtered, grouped, aggregated, augmented, and reshaped. However, conventional plots and tables like these show only the end results of the underlying analyses that led to them. One solution to this problem is giving the reader more context around the steps that lead to any given plot or table. Oftentimes, this is done through text and captions written to accompany a figure. However, these captions are, are at best only an approximation to the actual steps that were taken in any data analysis pipeline. And the steps in these pipelines are not always as straightforward as table manipulations in R, Python, or Excel. In some fields like computational biology, designing data analysis pipelines and providing tools and documentation to those pipelines is in itself a research contribution, like in the case of this pipeline recently published by another colleague of mine. Here's a short section of code that I recently wrote as part of a data analysis pipeline. And looking back at it, I was surprised to see that I basically know what's going on in this code, but to most people, it probably looks unintelligible. And even if it were intelligible, I know that nobody is interested in seeing this code. How do I know that? Because Adam Rule, recent graduate of this PhD program and recently minted pro assistant professor at the University of Madison, Wisconsin, told me so in his studies about how scientists use, share, and engage in collaboration uh, with computational notebooks. These notebooks often contain data analysis pipeline code, yet people who use these notebooks report that nobody is interested in actually seeing their code. We are faced with significant complexity in understanding or even being motivated to understand how these data analysis pipelines work. We can look at snapshots of the data, of the data as it is moving through these pipelines, uh, but that is still difficult to digest and to dissect. And the results, the end products of these data analysis pipelines don't give us much of any insight into what actual steps had to be taken for the data to be transformed into the data products that we end up consuming. While thinking about how we could better illustrate data analysis pipelines, we started to think about data animations. 
Before Professor Boroditsky claimed the throne of delivering the most popular TED Talk in history, Hans Rosling uh, once held the title. And uh, with this talk that I return to multiple times a year, the best stats you've ever seen. In the talk, he shows a graph where each country is a point on that graph with infant mortality rates on the x-axis and GDP on the y-axis. The graph is animated and it flips through several de decades uh, where countries represented by points move down and to the right as they get richer and their rates of infant mortality decrease. He's so excited as he's delivering this talk and the way he uses these data powered animations to tell the story of progressing global development is really inspiring. In Hans Rosling's talk, the data states that he is transitioning between are years in which these vital and economic statistics were collected. So we started to imagine what a data animation would look like if instead of the animation showing transitions between variables in a data set, like in Hans, like in Hans Rosling's case, our animations could show transitions between data states as they are transformed in a data analysis pipeline. And we are not just taking Hans Rosling word for it that the data uh, that data animations can effectively illustrate information. We know from prior work that people are good at following many different kinds of data transitions and that these animations can help them understand the underlying data in a visualization. Given the code from a data pipeline, our goal was to animate every step in that pipeline so that a viewer can better understand how the data is being transformed. There has been some prior work in trying to explain data analysis pipelines automatically. For example, the tidy log software package will print a sentence about how each function in a data analysis pipeline is approximately changing the data in each step. Here we can see that the filter function removes 50 rows from the data. Uh, and then the data are grouped by one uh, variable. The tool that we created to animate data analysis pipelines is called Datamations. And in our first implementation of this project, we decided to concentrate on a few core operations found in many data analysis pipelines. Uh, grouping observations according to variables, sorting data according to certain variables, creating new variables from existing variables, filtering out data, and calculating summaries of specify, uh, excuse me, calculating summaries specified by grouping variables. The first research question that we wanted to answer uh, as an exercise in testing the effectiveness of datamations in the wild was whether datamations can help people understand puzzling analysis results. We were challenged to, uh, we were challenged with how to study this and we settled on a well-studied statistical phenomenon called Simpson's paradox. Simpson's paradox occurs when a trend appears in several groups of data, but disappears or reverses when these groups are combined. In this way, Simpson's paradox can be illustrated by a small data analysis pipeline. For example, by calculating the same summary statistic after grouping data points according to different criteria. For those of you who are not as familiar with Simpson's paradox, let's take a look at an example. So you can imagine that you have a group of points and you go to draw a regression line through that group of points. And together, that group of points has a regression with a negative slope. But then if you regroup the points according to a particular variable, the regression within each group actually has a positive slope. The trend of the regression has completely reversed. The goal of our experiments is to understand whether data nations help people better comprehend the plots and figures they're shown by exposing more information about the underlying data analysis pipeline that led to them. To evaluate this, we designed experiments to see if data nations could help people understand an occurrence of Simpson's paradox within a data set compared to static figures containing the same results. We chose to study an instance of Simpson's paradox, again, because it is a case where understanding the, under, the underlying data analysis pipeline is crucial for resolving seemingly contradictory results. We created a synthetic data set which contains the results of a survey about employment, where each respondent provided information about whether they have a master's degree or a PhD, 
whether they work in industry or academia, and how much money they make annually in thousands of US dollars. This data set was constructed to show that on average, respondents with master's degrees made more money than respondents with PhDs. However, when the data are grouped according to whether respondents work in academia or industry, then PhDs make more money on average within each group. We had two hypotheses that we wanted to test in this experiment. Uh, first, we wanted to see if participants who saw a datamation could identify that a reversal in the trend of which type of degree holder makes more money overall uh, was, could even be possible compared to participants who only saw a static image. Second, uh, we were uh, curious uh, whether participants who saw a datamation could choose to, uh, the correct explanation uh, uh, for participants who saw uh, a datamation compared to participants who saw uh, only a static image. So in our experiment, we recruited over 1,300 participants from Amazon Mechanical Turk, who were split evenly among our conditions. Uh, we created two separate types of datamations, uh, and we tested uh, both of them, and I'll introduce you to both of these types of datamations shortly. Um, participants were either shown uh, a datamation or a static image, and we then asked participants uh, if two different experimental results could have come from the same data set. Uh, we then explicitly told participants that both sets of data came from the same data set. And then participants were asked to select the correct explanation for the reversal of the outcome uh, among a set of multiple choices. So just to be clear, uh, we created two different experiments, one using what we called plot-based animations and another using what we called table-based datamations. And we tested both hypotheses in each experiment. So let's talk about the first experiment with plot-based datamations. We showed each participant the following prompt, which I will now read. So imagine that you are an analyst working for a think tank. You conducted a salary survey with over 100 respondents in June, 2018. Um, each respondent worked in either industry, companies, or academia, colleges, and universities at the time of the survey. Also, each respondent had either a master's degree or a PhD degree. Each of the 100 respondents reported their work setting, whether they worked in academia or industry at the time of the survey, their degree, their highest education level obtained, which would be either master's or PhD degree, and their current salary in thousands of dollars. So then half the participants saw this static image. So you can see uh, on the graph on the left that people with a master's degrees make more money on average than people with PhD degrees. However, in the graph on the right, when broken out by workplace, whether in academia or industry, people with PhD degrees make more money on average compared to people uh, with only a master's degree. So the other half of participants who didn't see the static image uh, saw a series of two datamations. And I will go through each of these datamations frame by frame. But first, I want you to notice that the last frame of each of these two datamations is the same as the left and right graphs from this static image. So here's the static image. Take a look at this, and then take a look at the last two frames of this series of datamations, uh, which we're now going to dive into. So uh, let's take a look at the first animation. Um, so first participants saw each survey respondent as a gray dot on a grid. Uh, then the dots uh, separated into and were colored according to whether uh, survey respondents had a master's degree or a PhD degree. The dots then begin to move until they find their correct place along the y-axis to represent each individual's reported salary. The dots then collapse into averages and confidence intervals for each type of degree holder. Participants then saw a second datamation. Um, that datamation so starts off exactly the same way with every survey respondent represented by a dot on a grid. Uh, these dots then uh, move and are separated according to both their workplace and they are colored by what uh, degree that they have. So notice that there are relatively more PhDs in academia compared to master's degree holders, and there are more people with master's degrees uh, than PhDs in industry. 
uh, then these dots also begin to move into place until uh, they find their respective place on the y-axis uh, where we can see uh, that the trend looks like that folks with PhDs make more than survey respondents with master's degrees in both uh, academia and industry. And then those points collapse uh, to averages and much smaller confidence intervals um, uh, in this graph. So then uh, participants were shown uh, the static image, whether they were in the static image condition or they were in the datamations condition. So I just put the static image on the right below and they were asked this question, which we used to test our first hypothesis. So note that compared to people with PhDs, people with master's degrees make more in the left chart, but make less in the right chart. Does it seem possible to you that the results would come out this way? Um, so they could choose yes or no. And the correct answer is no, it seems impossible. Um, then uh, every respondent was shown this explanation that in fact, it is true that a paradox exists. So it turns out that these two charts are made up of the exact same data, just grouped differently. That is 100 people's salaries are represented in the left graph and the same 100 people's salaries are represented in the right graph. There is no mistake in the charts, but it may seem like a paradox when both are true that the left chart shows that people with master's degrees make more money than people with PhD degrees on average. But the right chart shows that people with master's degrees make less money than people with PhD, PhD degrees on average, both inside industry and inside academia. Uh, and then we ask participants to select uh, a, a, an explanation from a set of multiple choices. These were the choices. Um, these choices were uh, randomly shown to participants in the study, um, uh, except for the last choice, which of course is none of the above. Uh, and the correct choice is that most people with a master's degree work in industry, which pays more and drives up the average master's salary uh, in the left chart. So these are the results from the first experiment. Um, as you can see on the left, uh, more than 60% of participants who saw the datamation were able to identify the paradox correctly compared to uh, you know, around 47% of participants who only saw the static image. Uh, and then uh, close to 65% of participants uh, were able to uh, select the, the correct explanation when they saw the datamation compared uh, to around 47% of participants who only saw the static image. So next, uh, we're gonna talk about the second experiment, uh, which is about table-based datamations. So uh, the participants saw the exact same prompt describing the survey about education, uh, work setting and salary. Um, then participants saw this static image, uh, which is a table that shows on average how much folks with master's degrees make compared to survey respondents with PhDs. Uh, then on in uh, the right table, it shows uh, the same information broken out uh, with average salaries, but by degree and workplace, whether you work in academia or industry. Um, so one half of our participants saw the static image, the other half of participants saw uh, a table-based datamation, which again, I will walk through. And again, notice that the last frame of both of these datamations correspond uh, to uh, what is shown here in the static image. So uh, the first datamation that participants saw uh, first laid out this information where every survey respondent uh, is represented by a row with their degree in the first column, their work setting in the second column, either academia or industry, uh, and their salary in thousands of dollars in the third column. Uh, then the datamation zooms out to show all uh, 100 participants, each represented by a row. Uh, these rows then are then move, they're translated across the page um, until they are grouped so that uh, everyone uh, with a master's degree is grouped uh, in the first part of this table and everyone with a PhD is grouped in the second part. Then um, each of these cells uh, in the salary column uh, move and are translated over uh, to this new uh, uh, table being formed, or this new, these new rows really being formed on the right, uh, which represents 
all of these salaries being averaged, uh, the main uh, data table sort of fades away and the two new rows that we were, that were created come together. And then it zooms in to show uh, this final table showing how much master's degree holders and PhD holders make on average. Uh, datamation participants then saw a second datamation that I'm going to walk through frame by frame. So we start out the same way. Uh, it's the, the same table from the, uh, the uh, first table datamation. Um, it zooms out to show all 100 survey respondents in the same way. Uh, now, instead of being sorted just by degree, uh, or not sorted, but rather grouped, um, all of the participants, excuse me, all of the survey respondents are grouped by um, both their uh, degree, master's or PhD, and their workplace, whether they work in academia or industry. Instead of two new rows being computed, four new rows are computed to show that uh, the salary data is being averaged across four different groups. Uh, the rows then come together to combine, and then we zoom in to see our final table showing um, that folks who hold a PhD make more money on average uh, than folks who make than who hold only a master's degree across industry and in academia. We then asked participants the same identification question. However, instead of uh, and and they also saw the same. Uh, whether they were in the static image group or the datamation group, they saw the same static image with the final uh, tables along with this question. And again, the correct answer was no, it seems uh, possible that the paradox could exist. Uh, we then revealed that the paradox is in fact real with, in the same way that we did for uh, the plot-based uh, datamation group. And then we asked them the same set of multiple choice questions uh, with the same correct answer. And the, this is the results from that experiment. So as you can see, uh, you know, about 61, a little more than 60% of uh, participants who saw table-based animations were able to uh, identify the, the paradox compared to uh, participants who only saw a static image. Um, however, we did not see any statistically significant difference. Um, and uh, in terms of uh, participants who saw the table-based um, datamation compared to folks in, who only saw uh, the static image of the table. They both selected the correct answer at around the same rate. So a good question to ask about these results, of course, is who cares? Um, you know, something that Professor Holland told me early in my graduate career uh, was that if something is worth representing, uh, then it's worth representing twice. And, uh, you know, this has influenced a lot of my thinking. And I believe that people's need to understand these data analysis pipelines is only going to grow in the future. And therefore, designing new ways for people to see these pipelines, I think, is important. Um, uh, also, you know, these types of animated data visualizations are often very handmade kind of bespoke creations. And the tools that we've developed to, uh, to create the datamations as a part of the study, we hope can bring these types of animations to more people. Um, and you know, th this study shows some preliminary evidence that perhaps datamations can help people improve uh, their understanding of data analysis pipelines. Now, of course, this comes with some major caveats. We only recruited MTurk workers for the study we only tested Simpson's paradox, uh, which we could use to represent only a, a relatively small data analysis pipeline. Uh, and we only represented that pipeline by showing animated GIFs to uh, our participants. So of course, uh, you know, if you're familiar with my work, you can imagine some of my ideas and future ambitions for this work. I'm very interested in uh, whether datamations can be used to teach students who are learning about data analysis pipelines for the first time and are uh, learning uh, data wrangling skills. Um, of course, I'm also interested in whether a seasoned data scientist would make use of datamations either for better understanding uh, a, a data analysis code base that they're inheriting or for going back and uh, looking at past data analyses that they've done 
or even as you know a visual checking tool to make sure that uh, their data analysis pipeline is performing the way that they expect it to. Um, and uh, I am also very interested uh, in general uh, uh, in this concept of the data analysis pipeline itself or the, the pipeline code itself as being the input or being like this substrate for uh, uh, that we can use to, to create new things and to create better understandings um, of these pipelines. So I uh, would like to thank uh, my co-authors on this work from Microsoft Research, Xiaoyun Ku, Jake Hoffman, and Dan Goldstein. Um, of course, I'd like to thank everyone uh, in the Rumination Lab who supported me and I got to bounce a lot of ideas off of in this work, Dr. Guo, uh, uh, Ian, and Sam. And uh, of course, I, 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 you know, I wanna thank Andrew Chiva for leading all of us through this totally unprecedented uh, time uh, you know, to be doing research as a graduate student um, and as a third year uh, student in this department on in all of the uh, traditions and mentorship that go along with that. And you know, uh, I wanna say to the whole fourth year cohort, uh, we made it, we did it, we survived. Um, and now I'm, I'm happy to talk and to answer any of your questions. And, and thank you for your attention.